Well, hello in the dark. <laughs> How are y'all? Glad you're here. Get, please get your bulletin out. I want to do something with you with your neighbors and stuff, and you're going to need your bulletin to do it. So grab uh, the teaching notes. And um, what I've done is at the top of your teaching notes there, I've given you a list of 12 names in alphabetical order. And with the help of your neighbor, I'd like for you to place them in chronological order. <laughs> chronological order. You've got one minute. Ready? Go. I know some of y'all are thinking you should have been more careful about who you sat next to. 30 seconds. Got 30 seconds. Ten seconds. Okay. All right. Now, I know, I know you'd, have done, you'd have been more particular about who you sat by if you'd, had a, if you'd known this was coming. Okay, that's fair enough. And if I'd give you more time, you would have done fantastic. But this is just one way of us reviewing. Remember, if you're new here, we're working our way through the story. We're in part 17, but it's not too late to join. We're going to be working our way through the narrative of the Bible all the way to June. And so it's not too late to join us. There's resources out in the lobby area. When you leave, you can grab some of those to help you. The rest of those who've already been here, you're reading in advance, right? Coming, having read the chapter. Yes. (laughs) Two people said yes. I heard two yeses. Okay. So, and this is a way for us to review. The the idea here is that we would not only get a big picture of what what the Bible teaches, but also be familiar with it in the way that we can walk our way through the narrative of God. And so this is another way to do it. Number one would be Adam. Adam. Very good. Very strong response there. Number one, Adam. All right. Number two is Noah. Noah. Very good. Number two is Noah. Number three, Abraham. 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 Number three is Abraham. All right. Number four, Joseph. Well done. Just even if you don't know, just call it out. I like that. I like that. But Joseph is correct. Joseph would be number four. Number five? Moses. Moses. And then Moses was followed right after by number six? Joshua. Joshua. This area over here is very strong right in here. Very strong. You guys over here pretty much suck. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, really. Um, We were so sure when we did number one, Adam, the whole room just was coursing in. Okay, so number six is Joshua. Number seven, Judges. Very good. The judges come before the kings. And then number eight, the first king. Saul was the first king. This group over here, I'm still not hearing much over there. Somebody, even if it's wrong, yell something out. Okay, yeah, good, Saul. (laughs) Okay, number eight was Saul. Number nine, 
David, good job over there. He was the second king and the third king, number 10. All right, it's a little tricky. Number 11. Israel, the fall of Israel, the northern kingdom falls first. And then number 12, fall of Judah. So the numbers are here. You can see the numbers on your slide, on the screen, I think. And you guys can check your answers according to that. Well done. Well done this side. Hey, here's the good news. The good news, God's crazy about y'all anyway. So very, very good. Okay, so. What I'd like for you to do is get out your Bibles. If you brought one, if you brought a smartphone, get out the Bible on your smartphone or your tablet. Go ahead and open it up to 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22. And let me catch you up with what's going on there. The northern kingdom has fallen. Israel has fallen to the um, Assyrians. And now we're about to get to the place, almost to where this, this week, the southern kingdom of Judah will fall to the Babylonians. Now, there are a number of bad kings. Um, Mark mentioned one of them, a junior hire named Manasseh, led the nation in a very terrible way. But right here in 2 Kings um, 22, we're introduced to a kid who's in the second grade. And he is a great king. Josiah and and, um, actually last week Drew mentioned Hezekiah, two great reformers of the southern kingdom. Hezekiah and Josiah, very, very strong kings. Surrounded by not so good kings. So to put it contextually, Josiah is going to have a pretty long reign. And then three of his sons and one of his grandsons will be the last four kings. All short reigns, all bad. And then the nation will fall about 586 B.C. We're about 135 years approximately after the northern kingdom falls. Okay? 2 Kings 22 verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. Verse 2, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. Remember, David, even though he made many mistakes, his heart was given over to the Lord, and he is seen as the benchmark. And um, Josiah is one of the high marks Of all of the kings after David, he becomes one of the great reformers. Now, you go on down, and when you get to verse 8, 2 Kings 22, verse 8, you find a very... Here's what... Sometimes I can't decide what to preach on in the story because there's so much stuff. When I got to verse 8, I just got completely stuck. Verse 8. Hilkiah, the high priest... Many Bible scholars believe that Hilkiah was the father of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the great prophet associated with Josiah. Jeremiah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, is associated with uh, with Josiah. And Hilkiah, his dad, said to uh, Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law. This is a nation that is completely governed by the book. Now, Hebrews would have talked about the Old Testament scriptures, their scriptures in three ways, in three sections. The book of the law, which involved the first five books plus a little bit. The book of the prophets, which involved all of the prophets, both major and minor and a few others. And then the book of poetry, which would have involved Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and some of those. And so the book of the law is where all of the, uh, the regulations about how you work, when you work, how you bank, how you treat your neighbors, how you marry, how, how you worship, what days you do worship on, what goes on in the worship, how you tithe, everything about the governance of the nation of Judah and Israel is, comes from the book of the law. And they lost it. Are you kidding? I mean, you, you, they, there's nothing about their daily life that wasn't governed by this. And they, it's amazing that these people who are so centered and known among the nations as a people of the book, a people who follow the teachings of God written in this book, and they lose the book. And then I thought, We're a people of the book. Not all of our lives are, you know, regulated as strictly as 
the book of the law applied to the Hebrews in those days, but certainly the teachings of the Scripture, those of us who are Christians say that the teachings of the Scripture influence how we worship, how we bank, at what we do with our neighbors, how we run our businesses, how we do marriage. We would certainly be known as a people of the book. Now, I don't think we lost the book. The truth is, you and I own Bibles. We don't even know where they're at. Some of y'all lost a Bible three vacations ago that's still stuck up in the corner of the trunk of your car. You didn't worry about it. You got another one. I have six different Bibles on my desk that I use all the time. We're probably not going to lose the book. But right there, when I got to that verse 8 of 2 Kings 22, I just said, I got to talk about this. We, then we might be guilty, some of us, of losing the book. So here's the deal. My agenda for us this morning is to mess with your life. I, I, want, I want God to come and visit us in such a way that we would be have a fresh commitment. If you're here and you, don't say, you say, I'm not a follower of Christ, I don't believe in the book, that you would at least be challenged to begin to at least check it out and read some of it. And then those of us who um, are followers, that we would find a fresh commitment towards it. So let, pray with me and let me pray for that that would happen for us. God, we commit our time to you. And we ask... Holy Spirit, that you would help us to instruct us to open our eyes, to remove some of our biases so that we could approach the Word of God as the gift you intended it to be. Use this time, please, in the strong name of Christ. Amen. All right. So I want to talk to you about that. So now we're leaving the story and we're going to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.16. Um, the story spurred me on to talk about the scriptures and I want to talk to you about that. So turn now to 2 Timothy 3.16. It's also on your handout if you'd like to follow along there. And um, don't worry about that. It's just a note from another time. Okay. You a neat freak or what? I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's bugging her. Okay. All right, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, says this. All Scripture is inspired by God. Literally, God breathed. All Scripture, even the, bless you, even the parts that are hard to read, even like Leviticus, all Scripture is inspired by God. I did some work in the original languages about that word all. Guess what all means in the original languages? All. Every single one. In fact, Jesus' attitude towards the Word of God was not only all Scripture, but he was specific enough about the little tiny marks of each letter. He talks about a jot and a tittle and they are basically upside down commas above letters. And he says not a single one of them will fall away. That all scripture is inspired by God. Literally God breathed. Now when we talk about that, here's a definition. We believe in the plenary, which plenary means all. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Bible in the original autographs. We hold that God's word is therefore inerrant which means without error, and authoritative in every aspect of our life. Now, when I talk about being a literalist and someone who's very conservative in my view towards the Scriptures, a lot of people will, will talk to me about things that seem so obvious to them. And, and let me just tell you what inerrancy is not. Or it's not responsible to comply with. Inerrancy doesn't mean that everything is written in perfect English grammar. So English teachers, if you see something where a verb's used in the wrong tense or something like that, inerrancy doesn't mean that it's without 
English grammar error. It also doesn't mean that, that, it, doesn't, that there, it doesn't allow for different genres of literary work or even figures of speech. In John 6, Jesus says, if you're going to follow after me, you have to um, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Let me assure you that we have never attempted to teach here, even in the slightest bit, that you need to eat human flesh to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We understand that he's talking about a symbolic um, practice of the communion table, the Lord's Supper. He says in John 10, I am the gate, and people who the Father draws to me come through the gate. We don't believe Jesus has hinges. We believe it's a figure of speech. To believe in the inerrancy of Scripture allows for stuff like that. It also allows for the genre of the literature, like apocryphal language. Imagine being in 1000 B.C., and having to describe with your own words what you see if you saw a vision of 2000 A.D. traffic. How would you describe traffic when you've never seen a car? How would you describe helicopters going through the air if you've never seen anything fly other than birds and insects? How would you describe a nuclear explosion if you suddenly had a vision of some kind of an explosion of that magnitude when you, the best you've ever seen is maybe a small firecracker. Perhaps not even that. Well, you, you, would, use, you would use words of weather, thunder and, and nature, horses running. It allows, inerrancy allows for that. Inerrancy also allows, um, it doesn't demand that it has scientific precision in the way that words are used. It also doesn't ask for exact um, exactness in the quotations from Old Testament scriptures or from some other extra biblical resource that's recorded in there. Inerrancy means that the words that God intended to be, to be given to us were God-breathed. Here's another definition from Charles Ryrie. God superintended, superintended the human authors so that using their own individual personalities, they composed and recorded without error his revelation to man in the words of the original manuscripts. Another way to say it is in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That all Scripture is inspired by God. And because God has inspired it, it is useful to us. It is useful for helping us to understand what's right. The word there is teaching us what's true. It's not only that, but it also helps us in terms of what's not right. The word here is the, the idea of an umpire who's, who's calling a game and it reminds the players where the out-of-bounds lines or where the, where the rules cause, call them to per, preside in the competition. God's word is useful to us to what's right, what's not right, how to get right in terms of correcting us, what needs to change, and how to stay right. Another version of this says that God's word is it's inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correcting, and training in righteousness. What's right? What's not right? How to get right? How to stay right? Are you motivated yet to read something? It gives us this benefit. that It, it, it is useful for us. But there are still reasons why we might not turn to it. There are objections to the word of God. If you're here and you're not a follower, you might say, wait a minute, there's some things... I'm not sure I'm buying into all of this. The objections I hear from Christian and non-Christian are basically in three categories. There's more to it than this, but I'm going to be speaking in generalities, and I, I won't get through all the material. Today, we're going to be late. Just let me warn you. Those of you who don't like being late, I'm going to be long. At least I've been long three times. And if I keep rambling like this, I'm going to be longer now. <laughs> three objections. It's scientifically impossible historically unreliable, or culturally regressive. 
Let's admit that those of us who embrace Christianity come to the Bible with a bias. And here's our prejudice or our bias. We believe God is. And because we believe God exists, we believe in miraculous things that can happen. There are some who would hold that there is no reason, no, no facts to be able to hold up the reality of miracles being possible. Now, before you condemn me as one of those faith lunatics that flushed my brain down the toilet, let me suggest to you that whether you go with a naturalist position or a supernaturalist position, that both of those positions are positions of faith. And that it's actually reasonable from the fact that we are here today to draw some conclusions about the supernatural aspects of a creator God. Let me walk you through my own line of reasoning. A guy named, uh, where is his name? Francis Collins said this. We have this very solid conclusion that the universe had an origin. There was a time when they thought that the universe was eternal, but now it is very much uh, an agreement and growing in agreement among the scientific community that there was a point in time where the, where the, the uh, universe as we know it began. There was nothing, then there was something. Now that scientific theory allows me to project some assumptions. It per- first, that the universe was produced by a creative act. And if it was a produced by a creative act, then the creator is some sort of mind or has some sort of intellect. The creator used no natural law or forces of nature to create the universe because there was nothing here to use. And so that makes the creator supernatural or outside of natural. As space and time are within the universe, the creator must be outside of space and time because he created it before space and time existed. And that makes him eternal, him or her or it. The universe is material, and the creator was outside of the material, so that makes them spiritual. And the universe was created from nothing, so the creator is incomprehensibly powerful. I'm telling you that there is actually a reasonable conclusion that there was a force that created the universe that we have that was outside of time, eternal, outside of material, which made him spiritual, him or her, it, outside of of, um, the fact that he is um, powerful because it came from nothing to something. We call that person, that being, God. Our bias towards the scriptures is that miracles are possible because we believe God exists. The Bible spends zero time trying to defend the existence of God. It operates from that bias. Now, I'm not saying that you have to believe that way. We totally respect your your right to believe that there is no God. I'm just asking you, that you might consider that our position is, in, is the same as yours, a position of faith, and that it's reasonable, just as yours is reasonable. Now, one of the things that adds to the reasonableness of our desire and our belief in a God is what I will call the fine-tuning of the universe that even points more towards a divine creator. Let me read this to you again by Francis Collins. When we look from the perspective of a scientist at the universe, it looks as if it knew we were coming. There are 15 constants, the gravitational constant, various constants about strong and weak nuclear force, etc. They they have precise values. If any one of those constants was off by even one part in a million, in some cases one part in a million million, the universe could not have actually come to the point where we see it. Matter would not have been able to coalesce, and there would have been no galaxy, no stars, no planets, nor any people. That there seems to be this fine-tuning of the universe to support life on this particular planet. We call this fine-tuning the anthropic principle. 
which means basically it seems that someone or something were dialing the, the dials of what had to happen for life to exist very precisely. The tilt of the earth just right, the temperature of the earth, the speed of its orbit, the speed of its rotation, the place in terms of distance from the sun, the, the, the order and the, and the way, the properties of, of oxygen and how it interacts and the properties of water. That all of those things are exact in their nature. And it seems that in the anthropic principle that there is some fine-tuning by some created being to establish us. Another, now, this is not just held by Christians. Let me read, let me cite some other things. There's a book called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. There's another one called Just Six Numbers that, that speak to this fine-tuning. Astronomer Fred Hoyle said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the laws of physics. Physicist Freeman Dyson says, the more I examine the universe and the study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. Now there's a huge debate. I admit that there's a huge debate around this thing in terms of multiple universes and, and the, 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 whether there was a designer or not or whether it was just lucky us. Wow, lucky, lucky us. But I'm trying to suggest to you that based on the impact of this book and that it, the fact is, is that there's, it's at least reasonable to believe that there was a designer or a creator behind what we see and enjoy. That maybe this book has some merit and should be investigated. There's a second point about the miraculous aspect of this book that's even, I think, even more telling for us. And that is, is that this book contains literature writings that were prophetic in nature that, pre that predicted very specific events in the future. Events about the fall of nations, the names of kings, the, the secession of different, different powers. We'll talk about that next week in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, where it talks about the, the, this nation will fall, then this nation will come, and it will fall, and then this nation. In fact, there are over 300 prophecies about Jesus, the coming Messiah, that Jesus, that Jesus fulfills perfectly. Perfectly. Now, to put that in perspective, there's a guy named Stephen Stoner, and he says that if the Messiah were just to, to match eight prophecies perfectly, it would be like one the chance of that happening is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That number looks like this. Now, what's that, how does that play out? Let me give you an illustration to tell you how it plays out. He goes on to say that if you had that many silver dollars and you placed them across the wonderful state of Texas, <laughs> that you would cover every square inch of the entire state of Texas, two feet deep with silver dollar coins. And the chances of the Messiah being fulfilled in eight predictions or eight prophecies is the same as if flying over the state in a random way, some guy jumping out and parachuting down, walking around for days, and then bending down and picking up the one single coin that was marked with a black X in the whole state. Now you say, well, that could happen. You're right, it could happen. Just mathematically, it's called impossible. It's very, 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 very times the 17th. Improbable that that kind of thing would happen. Again, my point is, if it's just that eight of the prophecies are true, and here's 30 of them. Let me list 30 of them for you. It's shown there on the screen. They're too small, I know. If you want them next week and you want to read through them, I was just showing, I just wanted to show you the prophecies and the verses so you didn't think I was making this up. If he just fulfilled eight of those, it would be one in 10 to the 17th power. He, and he fulfilled all 30 of those plus many, many more. There is an amazing prophecy element to this book that says perhaps, just perhaps, miracles do happen. Perhaps, just perhaps, God in fact exists. Well, a second objection doesn't have anything to do with the existence of God. It has to do with the historical reliability of the passages. 
Is what we're reading really what God meant to be said? Or was it originally what God said and now it's been monkeyed with and changed by churches and men throughout the ages so that it says complete something completely different? Well, to check the authority or the, the accuracy of what we have, you would look at two things primarily. Manuscript evidence, in other words, tracing back to the oldest manuscripts and making sure that what they said is what we still have. And we can do that within a generation of the things that were written way before the Catholic Church and all of the things that they think got messed up by some secret society somewhere. So we check the manuscripts and then we would check the archaeological evidence to see if there's contradictions in what the Bible says versus what we're finding to be true. Let me take them in that order. First, the manuscript evidence. and just There's a lot more to this, but let me just share this one example to you. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, I think, in 1947. And at that time, when they were discovered, it was over 40,000 different parts of over 500 books. Just the scrolls were, it was massive discovery. And when they found these, these, um, these, these discovery, they realized, we have portions of the scripture here that are hundreds, in some cases, almost a thousand years older than any manuscript we had before. Does that make sense? In other words, we had... The book of Isaiah, and the la it, we found copies that were almost a thousand years older than the copy we had at that time. And we thought, many people thought, well, it's like the game of telephone. You say one thing, then another person says something, and by the time you get five people down, it's not even close to what you said. You've played that game, right? So we thought a thousand years, certainly there's going to be all kinds of errors in the copying and the recopying and the changing just, just by the fact that people are just writing it down. You make mistakes. Well, here's what we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Example, Isaiah 53. We had the complete chapter of Isaiah 53 in these scrolls. They had 166 words in it. In the 166 words in the chapter of Isaiah 53, only 17 letters were in question. Ten of those were the changing of how the word was spelled with no change in meaning. Four were stylistic in terms of writing the letter different, but it being the same letter. And three of them were in one word, light, in verse 11. And, they, and we're still not totally sure what to do with that one word. But we came away with this, this thought. It had 95% accuracy... 5% variance in spelling with no variance in the meaning from the passage. Over a thousand years. Are you kidding me? You're more likely to get errors in your cut and paste function of your computer than you are to find an error in what's going on from the generation upon generation as these scribes took it so seriously when they would copy down the word of God. They took it so seriously that when they, they would come to certain words and have to stop and wait a day. They would come to other words like Yahweh. And they would write one letter, throw the pen away, and go take a ceremonial bath. Change their clothes, come back, write another letter, throw the pen away. Come back, go take the bath, come back again to write out Yahweh. Can you imagine coming home from work? How'd work go today? I couldn't get a thing done. Kept coming up with God. God's all over the book. I can't get anything done. I got to stop and start, stop and start. I mean, they were that meticulous about all of the things that were going on. The New Testament is even better. There is more archaeological evidence. This is a quote. This is, there's more evidence for the reliability of the text of the New Testament as an accurate reflection of what is initially written in the autographs than there is for any ten pieces of classical literature put together. The Bible is also in better textual shape than 37, the 37 plays of William Shakespeare, which were written in the 17th century after the invention of the printing press. The, the scriptures have tremendous manuscriptual evidence that what we read today communicates to us what was originally inspired by God. So, if that's true, then what about the archaeological evidence? Surely, the things that have been written down, maybe we've dug up some stuff that really disproves it. 
And in fact, the case, that is just simply not so. The, the Bible is historically accurate and supported by that from every historical dig, archaeological dig that's ever come about. Let me read you a few things. Dr. W.F. Albright from John Hopkins University says, There can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial history, the historicity of the Old Testament tradition. Miller Burroughs from Yale said, Archaeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scriptural record. And then a guy named Nelson Kluick said, It may be stated categorically. Listen to this. This is amazing. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever contradicted a biblical reference. Not one. They're not, I hear things all the time from people, they're out there finding stuff all the time, shows the Bible's wrong. No, they're not. Not once. Not one time. Now, let me say this in respect, but compare this to the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon speaks of a society on the North American continent from the year 600 B.C. to 400 A.D. Great cities, great commerce, great wars that are supposedly all fought out on this continent. Do you know that there is not one, not one single shred of archaeological evidence that that society ever existed? Not one. And yet, on the other hand, the scriptures don't have a single, of tens of thousands of archaeological digs, there's not one single shred of evidence that anything is contradicted. So to say that it's historically unreliable is is really, quite honestly, uh, just a, a decide, you decide, don't bother me with the facts, I've just made up my mind. Because the historical facts clearly suggest that this this book, in fact, is historically reliable. So one last one. It's it's culturally regressive. Most people I talk to, they're not worried about the stuff they don't understand in the Bible. They don't like the stuff they understand. And they read things. It sounds like it it condones slavery. It sounds like it's it's oppressive of women. It sounds like that it's, it's bigoted in terms of its sexual preferences. And it, sounds like, it just sounds like it's just culturally so old. Well, let me speak to this in a couple of different ways. First, let me warn you about a category mistake. And that category mistake is that you associate new with good and old with bad. C.S. Lewis calls this um, chronological snobbery. And it's just a mistake because, well, a new car must be better than an old car. So new culture must be better than old culture. Well, both of those we could argue back and forth about whether they're actually true. But the truth is, it's, it's an arrogant position to say we are the most advanced of all time. And we are certainly, there's no comparison. 200 years ago, they were so, oh my gosh, they used the bathroom in outhouses back then. We have running water. We must be better. Really? Really? That's a, that's a dangerous position. And that's certainly a very weak position to dismiss all of Scripture because you think just because you were born in the 21st century or that you're living in the 21st century, you're the most advanced that the human race has ever produced. Strong arguments can be made otherwise. I'm not saying we're not. I'm just saying there are other arguments. That being said, let me suggest to you that there are also times when I read the Scriptures and as I read them and I think I read what it says, then I realize there's much more to it. Because the Scriptures did not speak out against slavery, it seems like it's condoning slavery. When the fact of the matter is that there's not one historical movement against slavery before the time of Jesus. And every historical movement that's against slavery after Christ is based on Christ's teachings. It is Christ, Jesus Christ, who elevates 
the position and the equality and the worth of every human being on the planet. It is Christ who says, regardless of how much you make, what your political stance is, what your zip code might be or what kind of watch you wear, that you have equal worth in the eyes of God, that every person has that. That is a Christian principle. And to say because something written in the first century didn't cause a a revolution right then, well, it must have condoned slavery, is maybe the purpose was not for political reform. Maybe the Bible's about something different than political reform. Just maybe. So as you read things, you would read that, you would realize there's more to it than what you're, you're getting. The husband is the head of the wife. Christ is the head of the church. And you just read that and you go, bah! I don't think that's right. Maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's more to understanding. Maybe the fact of the matter is, is that every women's suffrage movement that happened in 17th, 18th, and 19th century were all championed by the teachings of Jesus Christ and based on his teachings. Christ is the great woman's liberator because at a time in the first century in Palestinian, Greek, Roman world when women were simply property and nothing else, ever anything else, He said, here there is no distinction in the eyes of God between male and female. Are you kidding? So maybe when you read these things and you say it's culturally regressive, maybe you're just taking a little bit of a shallow view about what you read and maybe there's more to it. There are certainly things in there you don't like. I'm with you. But I'm not, because it says that all Scripture is inspired by God, I don't have the freedom that Thomas Jefferson had with a little exacto knife and cut out the verses he didn't like. The results of the Scripture are this. 2 Timothy 3.17, after telling us that all Scripture is inspired and useful for us by God, Tell us what's right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to say right. It says this in verse 17. God uses it, the scriptures, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Prepare has the, uh, the meaning of being well fit for something. To matching what's needed. The equip is a combination of words with, that says you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be, um, have all the supplies you need for the journey. You got anything in your life that you want to do that's good? You got a good work you're dreaming of? The Bible promises that it will prepare you and equip you for that very thing. Why would we, why would we lose it? In my own life, I've thought, why, why, how do I view the scriptures? I'm not, I'm talking to us. And I thought I view the scriptures in one of three ways. Sometimes I look at the Bible like vitamins. Now, please don't try to sell me vitamins, and please don't send me emails about vitamins, but I'm told that vitamins are good for you, that they'll, they're good for you. But here's the truth. Here's the truth of the matter. When I take my vitamins, I don't feel better. And when I don't take them, I don't feel worse. It's an act of faith that I take these vitamins thinking they're going to help me, but I don't feel it. And sometimes when I read the Bible, I'm told that it's, it's good for me, but when I read it, my day doesn't go better or worse. And when I don't read it, I mean, I might feel a little guilty, but everything can go okay. I mean, it's an act of faith to turn to the Scriptures without demanding an emotional high. Another way I look at the Scriptures is like salads. Now, I know some of y'all love salads. Please don't email me about salads. But, <laughs> but salads are good. I know they're good. I enjoy salads, and they're good for you. I know that, too. But the truth of the matter is they're not better than most other things. Almost everything with red meat's better. All, everything deep fried's better. 
but I eat salads because I know they're good for me. That I know that they'll, they'll help me. And sometimes I just approach the word of God like that. This is, this is helpful. I'd rather read a novel. That's better. It demands less of me and it's easier to read. I can read the San Jose Merc more faithfully than I can read the Bible sometimes. And there ain't nothing in there really any good. I'll, you know what? Maybe there is. I, if, if you work for San Jose Merc, please forgive me. I was just, it was just a hyperbole. It was just, I was just kidding. I know I need to quit teasing everybody. So then there's a third way I approach the scriptures. Every once in a while, and I wish it were more often than not. Every once in a while I approach the scriptures like strawberries in the spring. Now, I grew up in Texas, and being from Texas, we had strawberries, but they weren't really strawberries. You had, to, you had to dip them in powdered sugar to eat them. They were so tart. But strawberries from here, local strawberries that are fresh, first of all, let me tell you this. This spring, when you hold one up and you look at it and you see that color, that's what God meant when he said the word red. All the other reds are fakes. But then you can't wait to get it clean. You can't wait to take the little, little thing home, the little green basket that they're in, and wash them off really quick. That's one of the things my wife asks me every time. Did you wash them? Sometimes I don't even wash them. <laughs> I eat so many of them. Sometimes I eat so many of them, I have to tell you, that my mouth fills up with all those acidic sores, and I don't care. <laughs> I just love them. I just love God's word. I want to love it that way. I, wanna, I don't want to be a person who just does it because it's vitamins. I want God to produce in each of us, in all of us who call ourselves his children, a, a, an approaching to the, the word of God as his love letter to us. And so I want to do something that I hope maybe will help you. It's an experiment. I don't know if it's going to work or not. I'm not really a big high-tech guy, but someone with technology uh, skills helped me to set this up. And so I want, to, I want to help you where I can give you reminders every once in a while midweek to get into God's Word and, and to, to, to send you along a verse that means something to me or something like that if it will be helpful. And so here's what you can do. You can take out your smartphone. Do it right now if you want to. And you can take out your smartphone and text to 60... 96,000, 96,000, 96,000. And then in the message, write Westgate, one word. It's not cap sensitive, so it doesn't matter. Westgate in the message. Now, here's what I promise. You're doing this and you're going, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I promise I won't sell your numbers. I promise we won't use this. I'll, I'll, I'll promise that I'll try that we don't use this to to send you reminders about bulletins or stuff like that, or, you know, what you, some information. I'm just going to use it to enforce the teachings of the weekends and to and challenge one another to be in God's Word together. If you want that kind of a reminder, then you can just do this. Now, here's the cool thing, is that just type it in there, and if you hit it and you send it, and it comes back with a little message saying, you'll hear from me on Wednesday, it worked. Here's the cool thing. Anytime you want to stop it, you just take and write stop in the message. And it stopped. I won't know. It doesn't send me a little report that says so-and-so stopped. <laughs> I, don't, I ain't doing it if that's what happens. And I don't know if you're in either. I'm not looking at the list. I am not. So this is, this is just if this will help you. If it's a way that technology can kind of help you to get into it, that would be great. Could we be... Isaiah 40 says that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. May we become people who love God's word like strawberries in the spring. And may it never be said of us that we lose the book. May it never be said that we lose the book. That's good to hear. I'm good to hear. You guys are doing it. Well done. That doesn't bother me at all. All right, let me pray for us.
God, I ask that beginning in my own heart, I, I, I want this kind of love for your word. I confess to you that the Bible many times is, is like vitamins and salad. I don't think you're displeased at that act of faith. Um, but I know that you want to create in us more of a longing towards the love letter that it is. So I pray that you would have your way. And that we would be known as a people of the book. In Jesus' name, amen.